Hi, welcome to part four and the final part of this introduction to deep learning with Bifrost tutorial series. In this part, we're going to be looking at a few ways of improving our model now that we have our pipeline set up. When it comes to improving the model, there are a few levers we can pull on without even touching the model architecture or hyperparameters of the training. This is an oversimplification, but in general, we can look at the raw data, how the data is represented, and we can look at what happens during the training itself. The first technique I'll show here is on the data engineering side. So what can we do with the raw data? Now, after our first training attempt, we got some pretty poor performance. So the first thing we can do is look at the behavior and see if we can find any clues as to what's going wrong. And you'll notice that the model's doing okay if we move the controller along the z-axis, but it's having a really hard time on the xy plane. If we look at the two axes responsible for the movement on the xy plane, axis 2 and axis 3, and we sort of simplify that as a two-joint arm, you might notice that there are actually two different distinct solutions for this rig to reach that same point. So this is a pretty common problem in rigging. And if you're writing an IK solver the traditional way, you would usually account for this in the solver as a user input. So this is very similar to like a flip knee constraint, for example. Uh, so essentially what's happened here on our first pass is we're confusing the model. So it's seeing one input and trying to map it to multiple outputs. This is uh, obviously a problem that's super specific to rigging in this example, but the idea here in general is to look at the data you're generating and the context you're trying to use it in and make sure you're only asking the network to learn something it's capable of learning. So in this case, uh, what we're going to do is look at what we actually want our rig to do and then limit our training data to within that zone to make it easier for the network to learn. If we draw a line between uh, these axes, this is where the redundant solutions start. But we know this rig is a walker where this is basically um, a knee that's going to be bent and we don't actually want to pass, pass through this line here. So we can just set up our access limits on our data generator to make sure we're only getting solutions on one side of this line so that the network only gets one unique output for a single input. So if we pop back into Maya and turn off the visualization on our IK solve, we can pop back up to our data generation and regenerate some cleaner data within, within the bounds that we were just, just looking at. So if we turn on our sample scope here, uh, actually we'll turn on our, our, our FK solve. And then what we can do here is just jog these back and forth to get an idea of kind of better limits to set. So axis one was actually doing doing okay. So I think we'll, we'll keep this pretty, pretty close to what we had before, which was between somewhere around minus 75 and 45. And then really the, the culprit here was actually on axis three, uh, but axis two, just to be safe, we'll kind of imagine how we want this, this rig to, to walk. And again, this will be kind of a, a knee here. So it won't really go much higher than this. So we, before we had it set to plus or minus 180, it's kind of a little more room than we need. So we'll try to stick within what this rig is actually going to uh, have to do, and then that'll focus the, the network to learn on kind of a subset of the data that we're really interested in. So we can keep this one to about uh, minus 145 degrees on that side, and then as it starts to like kind of reach forward, it's probably not going to go much more than, say, plus, plus 15, 20 degrees, somewhere around there. And then lastly, again, the culprit was really on axis 3 here. And if you recall, we had if we drew a line between these two axes. That's about where the, the redundancy started. So if we start to, to play around with this value here and imagine a line here, we want to keep this toe on, on this, this side of that line. And that starts to happen around, just to be safe, like 30, 35 degrees. We're pretty, pretty clear of that line. And then everything over here is going to be a unique, a unique solution. And then our upper limit, we can keep about the same, which is where we start to run into what, what would be a collision on this rig, which is 165. So if we first turn our uh, data sample scope back on, we can see uh, the range we had before. 
and then pop in here and let's uh, just change these to the values we just discussed to get them kind of in a tighter zone we're happy with. So you can see that updating over here in real time. And what that's actually doing is updating our NumPy files in real time as well. So without actually touching anything, we can go back to our training code. We basically overwrote these, these feature files here. So if we hit play again, it's gonna pull from that new data set and then it's gonna overwrite our, our network parameters here. And something we might wanna do is uh, create a different folder v2 and then we can compare. In this case, I'm just gonna overwrite these. It'll make things really easy to, uh, to visualize this first pass. And you can already see um, the, the loss is actually much lower than the first pass we did. So it's clearly learning something now that training's done, uh, we can head back into Maya and turn our sample scope off, turn our uh, IK solver back on, and then uh, these weights automatically reloaded from our latest training run. We can grab our IK handle here and move that around, and you can start to see it's already much, much better. So just with a simple change, just by changing the actual data that we are inputting into training, we're getting much better performance. Uh, you can still see the, the toes bouncing bouncing around a little bit, so we uh, definitely have some, some room for improvement here, but at this point we've gotten gotten much closer, so we at least know we're, we're on the right track. So the last technique I'll talk about quickly is generally referred to as feature engineering. So the first approach was more or less looking at the raw data and finding the right subset of our data for learning. In this approach, we're actually going to look at how the features are represented in the training set. It's often referred to as feature engineering. So if we take a look at our inputs and outputs, as a reminder, we have the end effector location x, y, and z as our inputs and the resulting joint angles and degrees. And you might think that's all the information we have here, so what else can we do? It turns out that in machine learning, often just representing the same data in different ways can help the network learn better. Especially with angles, there are a ton of ways to represent angles, degrees, radians, quaternions, matrices, exponentials. Uh, the first time I ran through this project, I ended up finding a paper trying to do something similar to this, and they found that just representing each angle as two components with the sine and cosine helped the network learn better. So again, this is very specific to this example, but generally, the often that's the type of thing you're trying to do. Someone's tried before, either as a small part of their project or as a, as a very similar project. So it's it's often a good practice to just go out and find research papers doing something similar to you, and maybe maybe they uh, have a unique way of representing something that that you hadn't thought about. So we'll implement this really quickly in Bifrost again in our data generator. So we can pop in there, and then where we compute our samples. Before we build our array of thetas here, we wanna just do a sine and cosine on that. Now these are in degrees and in Bifrost, the sine and cosine the compounds use radians. So we'll also do a degrees to radians on each of these. And then we'll do a build array separately from, from our previous one, so we can still keep that in case we want to go back to it. And then we'll build this as sine of theta 1, cosine theta 1, sine of theta 2, cosine theta 2, etc. And then we'll exchange our output features here for this, this new array. And uh, again, we're just going to overwrite the, the existing input and output NumPy files, which has already been done. Now that those have been, those have been edited, our visualization here looks the same because these are just XYZ locations. But again, we can just run the training and then, and then look at the results when we load, load the weights here. Again, everything's procedural. So even though we did a lot of work to set up the initial pipeline, now we can just make these changes really quickly. Everything updates automatically, which is really nice. So I'll pop over to our training code again and train.
And you'll see here, we already, we can see this, this change already happened where previously our, these are input and output feature sizes. So where we had three input features and three output features before, we now have three input features and six output features, which, which matches, matches what we, the change we just made. Now, while this is training, I'm actually going to go back into, into Maya and set up uh, something, something we need now in order to evaluate the network properly because our output data is represented differently in our IK solver, we actually need to parse the output differently as well. So where here, first, second, and third index in our output array corresponded to theta one, theta two, and theta three, here they respond to sine of theta one, cosine theta one, sine of theta two, cosine theta two. So we need to now decompose these six, six outputs from the network back into single degree values. And we'll do that using the ATAN 2D compounds. So the first thing we'll do is duplicate these. So we get uh, six get from arrays. We'll separate our output here. So make sure all our indices are correct. So we'll get zero index, one, two, three, four and five. And then our ATAN the 2D node here, we'll need three of those for theta one, theta two, theta three. And these are going to be sine over uh, cosine here. And the output of this again is radian. So we wanna convert that back to degrees for our, our solver. And then pass these new values out to theta one, theta two, and theta three. And if we check on our training, that is likely finished, which it is. So we have one of the most up-to-date uh, network parameters here. So we go back to our high-level compound here and turn this visualization off. And this should now be our, our latest model. So this is a case where we can see we actually have an offset here. It's maybe maybe not as good in one dimension as the previous previous example. So this is the case where you'd actually want to probably more procedurally import, import your network weights, maybe based on um, a different, uh, different directory. You can have different networks stored in there. You can have different, different solvers, one for each version, put them side by side and really compare the two. So here again, the, the idea was to just give you a couple, a couple approaches, a couple tools you can look at a lot of this just comes down to experimentation, trying different things one at a time, adding adding things one at a time, so you can really start to get a sense of what's affecting your network in what way, and what uh, what ends up giving you the best the best results. And again, just to close out here, I wanted to highlight that even though uh, this might have seemed like a lot of work to do for a single rig. Like I mentioned before, now that we have this procedural pipeline set up, all we have to do is feed it a new rig and we can run it through this whole pipeline again in minutes. Even if we have a rig that has a prismatic joint, for instance, which translates instead of rotating or a rig that has more than three joints that has redundant solutions, uh, we can accommodate all these with the same exact pipeline. And with that, that's it. Hope you learned something in the series. I uh, hope you're able to use these new machine learning compounds in your own workflows to solve your own unique problems.